Sure. You want to call you, sweetie? Are you have a coffee? Yeah. So glad I saw you recently. recently. I know that was, no, was great. Right. No talking. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, no, you don't have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home, bring him home, support our boys in Vietnam, bring him home, bring him home, it'll make our general sad, I know, bring him home, bring him home, they want to tangle with the foe, bring him home, bring him home, here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle I may be wrong, bring them home, bring them home, but I got a right to sing this song, bring them home, bring them home. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring them home, bring them home. I'm not really a pacifist, bring them home, bring them home. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring them home. Find me out on the firing line. Bring them home, bring them home. Even if they drop their planes to bomb. Bring them home, bring them home. Oh, they brought helicopters and a bomb. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love for Uncle Sam, support our boys in Vietnam. Bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their fallacy. Bring them home. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And when in a few universal rules. Bring them home, bring them home. Welcome. Uh, I'm John McAuliffe. I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. And this is one of, I guess, 20 programs that we have done uh, trying to lift up aspects of the history of the movement that and helped to end the war in Indochina. Uh, the moderator for this program is Paul Lauder, who is a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, and I'll turn it over to him, Paul. Hello, friends and uh, family and uh, whoever activists are out there. Um, I am not going to introduce each of our panelists. They're too well known to need introduction in the first place and in the second place. Um, their biographical profiles online. You can check them out if you wish. I'm going to say a few words about the beginnings of the GI uh, anti-war movement. The 9th Marine Expeditionary Brigade landed on the beach uh, at Da Nang on March 8th, 1965. That was the first American combat force as such uh, in the war in Vietnam. And they uh, were there for eight hard, difficult 
impossible years, as we all are familiar. The first big anti-war um, demonstration was just a month later, April 17th, 1965, the, the led by SDS in Washington, D.C. Uh, it did not take long for that movement to spread. What we don't know is how quickly um, a GI resistance movement began to grow, but we do know a few things about it. The first underground GI newspaper, the Gargoyle, began to be published in 1966. Um, the Fort Hood Three, who refused orders to go to Vietnam, um, June 30th, 1966. Um, Howard Levy, Dr. Howard Levy, who refused to train Green Berets in dermatology because he said it would simply be used to recruit uh, Hmong uh, fighters to the American side and not for medical purposes. Um, he refused um, a direct order to train them and ultimately was sent up to Leavenworth for three years, two and a half years, uh, as, as it turned out. Um, the first coffee house that um, provided aid and comfort and pleasure and possibility to a lot of GIs was opened in Columbia, South Carolina in 1967. Um, and you can chart resistance by the movement of desertions, not to speak of fraggings and other things of that sort. Um, in 1967, there were about 40,000 desertions. In 1968, it was up to 55,000. Um, so, there is a growing quiet, at first, movement among GIs. It took the civilian movement a long while to understand what was going on and to uh, be a part of it. Um, as far as the, uh, we, we're going to talk tonight about films, about films that have to do with the war on Vietnam, and particularly um, have to do with GIs. And um, some of you may be familiar with the Wikipedia entry that John Kent did, uh, a listing of uh, films about the war. It is really a wonderful uh, listing. I'm, I'm, I, I won't give you the um, uh, the URL because it's easy to look up in Wikipedia under um, uh, Vietnam War films. Um, many at first, like Green Berets, 1968, were pro-war, um, and um, they gradually spread. But there were very few, really, very few produced from the perspective of GI resistors or speaking to their concerns and interests. And the films that we're going to talk about tonight um, fit into that category. They come out of a concern for GI resistance, and they speak to where the guys and women were uh, in 1966 and 1967, and on from there. Um, one of our panelists seems to have disappeared, uh, Connie Field. I'm hoping that she will uh, appear uh, in due course of time, and therefore we will go back to our original um, structure, which starts with both the uh, heroine and the uh, central figure in um, the one of these films that was made during this period, and that is FTA and Jane Fonda. Uh, Thank you, Jane. I'm very grateful to be part of this uh, coming together to archive information about the Vietnam War. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John McAuliffe, for for always being there and trying to set the history straight. We we all know that the saying, don't, you know, you have to understand history so you won't repeat it. 
and there's a lot to be learned from from the Vietnam War that we haven't <laughs> that we haven't learned yet. I didn't really know very much about the Vietnam War at all in 1968. I was living in Paris, married to a Frenchman, very pregnant, and then lo and behold, there were a lot of American a lot. There were eight American GIs who had resisted the war, left. They'd been in Vietnam. They left Vietnam. They came to Paris. <laughs> To, to 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 try to create li a life for themselves they were always in danger because if anybody discovered them they'd be turned in you know who, by the way you know who gave them uh room and board the great sculptor alexander calder that's that. they oh, stay well they discovered that there was this american actress me who could maybe help them and so i i met them and and this is around the time that barbarella was had just been finished and they they talked to me about the war and I, they told me terrible things that were being done to Vietnamese civilians and by the U.S. military and I didn't believe it. I really didn't believe it. And they gave me a book by Jonathan Shell called The Village of Ben Sook. And when I read that, I I suddenly realized I have to join the anti-war movement. And Shortly thereafter, I left France, I left my family, I moved back to the United States and joined the GI movement. I became a civilian supporter of the GI movement. It made sense to me. If the soldiers that are sent over there to fight the war themselves don't want to fight, well, that's a great way to end the war. And as it turned out, of course, Richard Nixon, if you go into the files and the recordings of his of his tapes, it was the GI movement. That was the part of the anti-war movement that Richard Nixon was most afraid of, of all. And so after um, a while, I was in New York, I made I had made the movie um, Flute with Donald Sutherland, and I had gotten to know Captain Howard Levy, who Paul already mentioned, he was a big hero in the uh, in the GI movement for serving time and and refusing to do what his conscience told him was wrong. And he came and visited me in my apartment in New York that I had rented to make a movie with Donald Sutherland, and Donald was there too. And he said, "Why don't you guys put together a troop of performers to tour military bases overseas?" Um, the way Bob Hope does, only yours will be against the war and call it FTA. There was a one of the GI uh, newspapers put out by war protest. It was called FTA, fuck the army. And so we did. We put together a troop and Holly Near, <laughs> who is here on your screen, was this young actor, singer, and we auditioned her and oh my God, <laughs> Holly joined us. And she was she was so good. Rita Martinson, Michael Alimo, Glenn Chandler, the late Glenn Chandler, Rita Martinson, Pamela, Pamela Donegan. Donegan. Um, <clears throat> we started out working with Alan Meyerson, who who he, he ran a, a comedy a comedy program in San Francisco, I think, and Howard Hessman and Peter, Peter, what was his name? Peter, who, who was in Joe and he was in oh, um, Boyle, Peter Boyle, Boyle. Yes, the great, the jazz singer, um, my memory, what was her, what's her name? I talked to you about Barbara, Barbara Dane, Barbara Dane. And, uh, country Joe McDonald, I think was doing this work. And um, Jules Pfeiffer wrote some skits and many different people wrote skits. And we performed at military bases in this country. And, um, and then- You performed outside of the military bases, right? Not- All the ones military bases. We're not on, yeah. Paul and John have said there were these coffee houses that were set up to teach guys on the basis about the history of Vietnam and things like that. And so we, we performed in the GI coffee houses in the United States. Nina Simone joined us. We went to Fort Dix in New Jersey, right? We performed it to raise money because we wanted to go overseas. We we performed at Carnegie Hall and Nina Simone was, was with us. It was amazing. But, um, there were differences of opinion. We did. It was all white people, and it was mostly men. And 
we wanted to to have it be more feminist. And so um, Francine Parker, a film director, came on board as director. And the people that I've already listed, including Holly Near and Lynch and the others, and Donald Sutherland <clears throat> and myself, and we, uh, everybody sort of wrote stuff. Right, Holly? Yeah, and what's amazing to me, if I can just interject, Jane, is how extraordinary that in 1971, which is what we're talking about, I think I was 20, and the, the fact that you had the foresight to understand when the ultimate troop that went across into the Pacific was four men, four women, four people of color, four white people, which is, if you look back at it, was pretty unheard of in the anti-war yes. movement. Wow. And it was, um, I've always wondered how, where that came from, but it was brilliant. And it made for a very different uh, relationship to the soldiers. And you can see this in the FTA film very clearly because we did have, well, I won't, I won't interrupt the rest of your story, but I just wanted to tell you, I think it's amazing that you and Francine had the foresight to put that together. And, and you really, I really think when I see the film, I think, wow. I didn't realize how politically sophisticated we were. I think yeah. Francis brought a lot of that on. Um, so we decided, we we planned our itinerary and we decided to make, to film it. It was needless to say, a very skeleton crew. I mean, we moved fast. We had to be able to set up the stage and take it down very fast. We performed in bull rings on islands and I mean, all kinds of strange places. And we, you know, there were, times when the brass of the particular military base, sometimes like the sailors at Subic Bay in the Philippines or the Air Force people in, in, at the Air Force base in the Philippines when we performed on that island and there were threats against our lives. And the soldiers would be told the show is taking place and they'd give the wrong address and the wrong time. So we would just wait <laughs> until they found out where we really were and then they'd show up and we'd perform. And all in all, I think, it's, we performed for about 60,000 active duty servicemen. They were mostly men then. Women were not in, in combat then in war. Um, we, we did we did have a few women, right, Holly? Well, they showed up. Um, they weren't necessarily, and we did workshops with them. I think the organizers made an effort to find the few women who were in the audience and in the movement, because in the film, there, there was one meeting that was set up that was with women. So all of the camera, the sound, the everything was learned by women. So I, as an actor, didn't know anything about sound, but I learned how to hold a boom because it was gonna be a women-only meeting. I'd never heard of women-only meetings before. I mean, that's another thing that was really radical. Then there was a people of color meeting and all of the white crew turned over and trained the black actors to do the filming of it because they wanted those safe spaces and you can see it in the film. You can see how those meetings are different because of those choices that that you and Francine made about having women only and people only, uh, women of people of color only, it was it, it's extraordinary. Well, at that time, I think what we wanted to do was to carry the anti-war message to active duty GIs that were actually on military bases in the Pacific. And they and came in the thousands. They came in the thousands. Six thousand all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then some people made bootleg cop, uh, video copies of the book thing that got sold for years. Uh, people, friends of mine, like the lawyer, uh, Kenny Cloak, who, who knew a lot about military law and taught me a lot. Um, and he went back to the Philippines and to Japan later and said every, everybody had copies of, of our show that were, that were bootlegged. A lot of people saw them. We wanted most of the skits, most of the things that we talked about in that show came from the GIs themselves, came from the, 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 the coffee houses and the movement newspapers that we had read. And so they felt that we saw them and we understood them. Yeah, it was very authentic because it wasn't a bunch of white anti-war people writing stories about them. These were their stories using their language, using words that somebody like me had to learn as we were going, like what the hell is fragging? What is uh, insubordination? What is, these were the words that were coming out of, from the soldiers that a layperson like me had to learn. Exactly, by the way, in case somebody the people watching don't know fragging is when you roll a hand grenade up to through the tent of your commanding officer and blow his foot off. Just so you know, the extent to which these guys did not want to have to fight 
<laughs> yeah, they were going to be sent in on a on a dangerous mission to go into across a, a a dangerous line and fight with Vietnamese people. And you hear in the film the particularly black soldiers saying, "These people have never come and hurt me. They've never." Uh, lynched me. They've never not allowed me to go to school or to vote. Why am I here killing them? And so they, the soldiers put their foot down. They said to their commanding officers, we're not being sent out tomorrow morning. And the officer said, well, if, if you don't go, I'll write you up for insubordination. And they said, well, if you, if you continue in this, you'll find your tent blown up. And that's your description of fragging. <laughs> um, they, they just said, no, we're done. We're, we're absolutely done. And they sat out there from what I understand. Um, David may know the numbers of this better, but for months, not fighting. For months, while people back home in the government thought that they were out there fighting. They just stopped. Yeah. And I, it was a huge learning experience for all of us. We... Um, you know, we, we spent all that time talking. These were working class guys and a few women and what they thought about and why they didn't like the war. And, you know, it was just, it was a very eye-opening experience for us. And they and were they, young, Jane. I mean, I was 20, 21. So were they. They were 18, 19, 20. And yet and, having very, yeah. very sophisticated conversations about capitalism and imperialism and military industrial complex and all. I mean, they were reading out there while they were sitting, not fighting. They were educating themselves. And you can see on their faces during some of the performances that they're, that they're moved. Oh my and, God. You know, Weeping. Just, yeah. You know, when Rita Martinson sings, dear soldier, we love you. Wow. You know, there were tears. Yeah. It was, it was really something. We came back, I think right before Christmas, 1971. And the film was then edited and it was released by a company that was apparently very close to Richard Nixon. <laughs> New American Cinema. I can't, David, do you remember what the name of the? Yeah, it was American <laughs> International. American International. Yeah. And I remember I attended the opening in New York <laughs> and then it disappeared. And that's so funny that that's the company. My first. One of my first films I ever did by when I got to Hollywood when I was 18 was put out by that company. And it was a heartbeat away from from porn and inappropriate. I mean, they did not do a lot of nice films, <laughs> that company. But nobody else wanted to release it. And so <laughs> then they pulled it. Yeah. It, it was an, another thing about the, the script itself, and you can see this in the film, is the the connection between, and this was another thing that was really important that you and, and Francine did this, the connection between the military landing and occupying a country. That word's flying around a lot right now, but occupying the Philippines, occupying Hawaii, occupying Okinawa. And what happens to, I remember meeting a young Filipino woman who had been a farmer like me, the uh, military base landed on on their land. They had to move to the city to make a living and she couldn't find work. And so she became a prostitute, a sex worker. And she would go to the, the ships as they were getting it in Subic Bay, pick up a soldier, have sex with him, take his money. Half would go to her family and the other half went to a Filipino revolutionary organization that was resisting occupation by United States you know, American imperialism. This was a lot for me as a 20, 21 year old kid to absorb when I landed there, but it made so much sense as a foundation to understanding how militarism works. And, and because from that point on, once I got it, I, it, it applied to everything for the rest, for the last 50 years. I mean, once you understand that concept about how this this works and it worked in, it was the same in Hawaii. These poor soldiers were being told they were going to R&R, &R, rest and recuperation in Hawaii. And that young Hawaiian women were waiting for them and were going to make love to them. They arrived there and these young women were not waiting for them. And when they tried to rape these women, the Hawaiian brothers showed up and they got into killing knife fights on the beach. I mean, this was not a pretty picture of rest and recuperation on the beautiful island of Hawaii. And this is what was happening country after country after country, um, how the, the U.S. Was. Was. So what? Farmers, 
Okinawa talking to us about when well, we had a, a group of Okinawan uh, musicians perform during the workshop. It's a beautiful song. I hear it now yeah. and about how they don't want occupation by the United States and get rid of your military bases. I mean, that was so powerful coming at us as we as we, and we saw these picture, these children who had hearing aids because from the time they were born, they were living underneath bomb practice. So there were canisters being dropped constantly and they became deaf. So all these little children running to school, playing, you know, swinging their hearing aids around, but they all had hearing aids because they'd lost their hearing under the bombing canisters. You know, it's hard to know exactly what effect the movie had on the anti-war movement. Um, because it wasn't seen by very many people, which is why I'm so glad that it's showing on Netflix right now. Thank you, Ted Sarandos. Um, as is Sir No Sir that you're going to hear about next from Dave Zeiger. Um, but Nixon knew about it and, um, and it scared him. And of course, after that, there was uh, the Winter Soldier. I mean, there was the Winter Soldier investigation and you know, John Kerry started getting involved, and uh, the throwing the medals over the fence in front of the White House that was a, that was a big deal, and that was an outgrowth of the GI, of the GI movement. And then I don't know what year it was, but that moment that Martin Luther King decided to make the connection between the civil rights movement and the war against people of color in another country. Does anybody remember when? What was it? Sixty-seven. 67. I mean, that was huge. That was huge. And the program John was talking about that I did about Black black anti-war music, that that is a real kicking off point in cities like Detroit and Chicago, urban areas where, where Black soldiers were returning to these urban areas with no jobs and no prospects and total alienation um, and the music that came out of, out of that. But when, when King made that connection, um, that was a very important for all of us, I think, who were paying attention, that the racism, the racism connection, the, the ability to go in and kill brown people in a way that we would not have uh, allowed our government to kill white people. I just also, before I finish, I, I want to say something. The Vietnamese were victorious in the war. But it was not because our soldiers weren't good soldiers. Probably the United States has never fielded better, braver soldiers. It's just that they weren't stupid, these men. And they understood that this was not the right war. Yeah. And many of them were brave enough to say, no, I'm not going to do it. That's I, what bravery is. Over the years, I've met with so many GIs and too many of them think it was their fault. And I, I think it's important that we let them know it wasn't It wasn't your fault. If we didn't make this movie or become active in the GI movement because we wanted to blame soldiers. In fact, I'll have to say that in all my years of being in the anti-war movement against Vietnam, I never met any anti-war activist that blamed the soldiers. I know everybody, you know, I'm ashamed that my movie Coming Home, which grew out of my experiences with GIs, that there's a scene in there where there are anti-war protesters screaming at the GIs. The press says that happened a lot. I never saw it happen. Did you, Dave? Did you, Holly? No. I mean, how could, it's a big country, and there were some unsophisticated anti-war activists who were angry and upset, and, and we know that about social change movements. We don't all get born into great wisdom. Um, so yeah, maybe it happened, but it was not the main call from anybody who was doing anti-war work as far as I ever knew. And soldiers came when I toured with you, Jane, for the Indochina peace campaign, soldiers, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers came and hung around and, and we befriended them. And there was always a great relationship between them. And they, and we learned from them. They were leaders and teachers. They were not being, um, uh, following us. We were following them. That's a good um, uh, uh, yeah. introduction to Dave Zeiger's film, actually. So, David, why don't you uh, tell us about Sir No Sir? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. And I just, before mentioning, talking about Sir No Sir, I just want to emphasize that 
FTA really should go down in history as one of the great uh, activities of of um, uh, of of actors and actresses, uh, you know, of, of of artists in 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 kind of the the annals of 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 anti-war or any kind of progressive causes. It was it was extraordinary, and I think Jane and 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 Holly have really brought out. Uh, how extraordinary it was, and it it can't be can't be emphasized enough. And and it was, uh, it was pulled from theaters. We it's never there's never been any um, uh, confirmation of how that happened. It's a bit strange that American International would would release it and then suddenly pull it, um, and it did disappear. It really did, except for bootlegs and. Um, uh, I just want to give a shout out here and now to uh, uh, the, the organization Indie Collect um, and 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 uh, Sandra um, Sandra. I forgot your last name. I'm so I'm so sorry. Um, uh, that that in uh, about three years ago, I believe three or four years ago, uh, raised the money to restore FTA. And to bring it back into the world had an incredible screening um, here in Los Angeles at uh, the Egyptian Theater and was then released, re-released or released really for the first time by um, uh, Kino Lorber. And it's now on on uh, Netflix for everyone to see, along with Sir No Sir. And that's all the result of, of the... Um, uh, the great work that Indy collected and Sandra Schulberg. Um, Schulberg. So I do, I do want to kind of mention that because that's important. I think the spitting um, myth is a, it is a good segue into Sir No Sir because just a little bit of a brief history here. Um, I worked in the GI movement at the Oleo Struck Coffee House in Fort Hood for two years. Uh, I was there for the second of the anti of the. Armed Forces Day demonstrations that that had uh, over a thousand GIs uh, marching right outside the gates of Fort Hood, which was unprecedented. It's everything in the GI movement, by the way, was unprecedented. Not, nothing like this had ever happened before. Um, and I, I had gone down there at the age of twenty, convinced that I would never get out alive, just for for a number of reasons. The Klan had been very active um had had shot up a car a van going to a demonstration uh and it was just and and the oleo strut the, the actually when i made sir no sir the film 2005 there was still paint on the sidewalk in front of the building that the oleo strut was in from all of the paint that had been thrown at the front of the building by locals you know usually kind of high school football players they were uh they attacked it a lot um but so I was there for a, a good deal of 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 some of the, the most incredible things that happened in the course of of, of that movement. Um, and I started making films in in around 1990. And the 1990 was a particularly significant year because I, you, uh, there had been, you know, this kind of rumors and all these kind of things starting to be put out there about GIs getting spat on and films started Hollywood films really started to promote that particularly the uh, Rambo films um and I had the same I had a similar kind of reaction I said I don't I, I don't know what I didn't see this I don't know what the hell they're talking about but then in 1990 when the first Gulf War happened which was the first major uh military um uh, invasion uh, since Vietnam by the United States. Um, there was an in incredible phenomenon that happened leading up to that invasion. Uh, there were the largest demonstrations since the Vietnam War against it. This is the first Gulf War. And at the same time, suddenly all of these stories started spreading about anti-war activists spitting on GIs during the Vietnam War. And they, they suddenly became ubiquitous. They were everywhere. And the result of that was it had a very specific result. As soon as the American troops were on the ground um, in that first invasion, this massive anti-war movement literally disappeared. And it disappeared because 
people had been convinced that during the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement spat on GIs, uh, denigrated GIs, all of this kind of stuff. And the, the watchword was, we can't do what they did then. We can't do the same thing. So as soon as American troops were on the ground, suddenly there was no movement against it. That was a very political thing that happened, and it happens directly as a result of that spitting myth. Um, I won't go into a lot of details about it. Uh, there, John Kent also now has a Wikipedia page about it, and I would urge everyone to read that Wikipedia page. He did, he did extensive research on the myth, where it came from, how it got promoted, what what you know what happened and didn't happen. Um, but back to the story of how Sir No Sir got made, fast forward to 2005, I'd been making films. I'd always kind of thought, well, this would be a film that really needs to be made, but I never thought there's no way I can get, I can make, tell this story. Because this is the story, by the way, that that has, it's the story that has been suppressed about the anti-war movement during the Vietnam War. There's, you know, it's it, the student movement, the uh, even even Martin Luther King and and uh, uh, the, the national uh, the, the black liberation struggle and its relation to the anti-war movement, um, the weathermen, all of these things are in every history, you know, in every, you know, they're all over the place. The GI movement was virtually non-existent and it still is in 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 certainly in uh, it was non-existent in in um, Ken uh, Ken Burns series on the Vietnam War. Um, and in fact, the spitting myth was had replaced it. And I think what happened was that the um, the spitting myth had really replaced any knowledge about what the GI movement was and what had happened. What prompted me to be able to make the film, Sir No Sir, was the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2005. Was it 2005 or earlier? Um, and suddenly, um, again, the spinning you know uh, myth was out there. But I had been given a given actually a few years before that a good friend of mine, Ron Schneck, handed gave me a book uh, called "The Spitting Image" by Jerry Lemke, and it was a revelation. And it, and I really encourage people to read that book. Jerry was a, a Vietnam vet, uh, a professor who went back and 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 did his own research to try to find where this the myth came from and to see, is there any truth to it? And he found no truth to it whatsoever. Um, but I won't go into the details about that, but that really kind of opened my eyes to what was going on here, um, that replacing the, the knowledge of the GI movement with this myth was playing a very, very big political role. And the exact same thing happened with the, with the American invasion of Iraq that it happened with the first one in 2000, in, in 1990. As soon as troops were on the ground, this massive anti-war movement that had been, you know, taking over the country again disappeared. And if you go back and look at the history during the time that the troops were in, in Iraq, I, I, I should have said Iraq anyway, during that time, there was very little anti-war activity in this country. And uh, again, the idea was, the, the watchword was, well, if we if we if we have a, a big movement against the war with the troops there, we're accusing the troops of being baby killers, and we're doing the same thing that the anti-war movement did uh, during the Vietnam War. So this thing had a very big uh, political purpose. I started trying to raise money to make tell the story of the GI movement, and the interesting point about that was, after being successful raising a lot of money for previous films that I had made, I was not able to raise any money in the U.S. I was re it was rejected over and over again, um, and I went overseas. And we suddenly what 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 we found was that the story of American soldiers refusing to fight a war was a very popular story in the rest of the world, uh, as far as the mainstream media was concerned. So France, Arte, BBC. Australia, Spain, everyone, everyone wanted to wanted to tell that story. And so we were able the funding for the film came from international TV because they were the ones that 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 were interested in that story. And it wasn't until the film was finished that 
we got a lot of a lot of attention and and had a very you know very big run in in a lot of different ways and and uh, by the way uh jane uh once again played a very big role in in helping that uh, to make that happen um the 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 uh, you know i won't talk that much about the film i think you know you can you, if you haven't seen it you can see it and and i think probably a lot of folks watching this now have seen that film um, I just think the important thing to say here is that this isn't, what is it, you know, the past isn't the past, or the past isn't dead, it's not really, it's not even the past. In relation to this story, that is very true. Um, there will, it will continue to be, it's a battle to, for this story to, you know, be out there in the world and to be part of, of any um, analysis or, you know, looking at what happened during the Vietnam War, not because of just it's important that it be, you know, correct historically, but because it has been and it will continue to be the, 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 the you know, the, the, the opposite story, which is the spitting myth, is going to continue to be out there in as big a way as possible for as long as possible to promote future wars. To promote future um uh the continue of course the continuation of imperialism uh by this country so um that's what i found in the course of of making the film and 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 screening it and and you know and and all of that is that it is still it's still a revelation for people when they see you know that, that, that both the, the fact that there was this um this movement and then the fact that they've been lied to so bitter, so so deeply about it through the spitting myth. Um, so I guess that's that's. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing film, David. It really is, and yeah. even having seen it many times, I I still moved by it and reminded by it the the way in which militarism has dominated our lives for so long, both the people who are. Um, the military lands on the soldiers whose lives are are threatened and put in danger. Um, it, it's a it's a very well well done film and answers a lot of questions. So thank you for making it. Thank you, thank you. I see that um, uh, Steve Talbot um, is. I don't see his image, but I see his name there. Uh, and he could add, um, from the uh, perspective of uh, a more recent film, um, uh, not a, not focused on the GIs, but um, but focused on uh, the the anti-war movement, the, the movement, and the madman. Steve, uh, do you want to say a few words? Uh, sure, Paul. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, we can't right. see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, if I get around to it, you'll be able to see me too. Anyway, it's wonderful that um, this webinar is being held, and it's great personally for me to see you, Paul. Um, we go way back. And uh, to Jane Fonda, who I used to work with at Indochina Peace Campaign way back in the early 1970s. Um, so yes, the, what I was referring to is that I made a film with Robert Levering um, and Stephanie Mashura this year called The Movement and the Madman. Um, I hope a lot of you have seen it. Uh, it aired on the PBS series, American Experience, and it's now available on PBS Passport and Amazon and all sorts of platforms, uh, including Canopy, the free library platform. And it just showed in England yesterday. It had its debut on PBS America. But that film is entirely set in 1969. And one of the big motivations that we had in making the film was to really show what the anti-war movement was like that year in particular. And there were some really broadly based enormous demonstrations that took place. Many of you will remember the national moratorium on the war on October 15th, 1969 which took place all across the country, involved um, between two and three million people. And then the big national mobilization on November 15th, 1969, giant march, the biggest ever in uh, Washington, D.C., 
biggest ever at the time. And uh, one in San Francisco, which was also the biggest demonstration that had ever taken place around anything in the United States uh, west of the uh, Mississippi uh, in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. So two huge demonstrations against the war. And they were very broadly based. They involved huge coalitions putting them together of people. Uh, a lot of people from the civil rights movement. Um, Coretta Scott King was very active. Martin Luther King's widow um, really carrying the torch of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement together. So it was a very exciting time. A lot of music, a lot of cultural stuff, uh, performers, uh, great people uh, involved, Pete Seeger, Richie Havens, I could go on and on. But the really, it was a film that American Experience called a film about the power of protest, because those protests at the time ended up, and none of us knew this at the time, uh, preventing a major escalation of the war in Vietnam that Nixon and Kissinger were planning secretly. It was called Operation Duck Hook, involved um, all sorts of plans for a huge escalation of the war, including full bombing of North Vietnam, resumption of that, and threats that they were making all that year privately to the North Vietnamese and to the Russians to use tactical nuclear weapons. So that was the threat, that was the danger. Uh, they said November 1st, 1969, as the date they were going to launch this, if the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese had not accepted Nixon's peace terms. And uh, they backed down. And they backed down overwhelmingly because of these big demonstrations in the fall of 69. So the anti-war movement that we show is not only very broadly based um, and nonviolent, but also effective. Thank you, and Steve. was led. Uh, last thing I'll say. Sorry for the long rap there, but um, the last thing I'll say is that that march in Washington was led by active duty GIs, followed by a contingent of veterans from yep. uh, from wars of the past. So even then, in '69, that early, um, GIs, anti-war GIs, were were getting mobilized. That is right. Um, I, um, just a, a couple of things. I'm looking at the, you know, the conversation, the, the questions and stuff. Um, yeah, I do. I, I do want to acknowledge the, the the film, The Boys Who Said No, which is also another a, a recent film about the uh, uh, anti draft movement that was very powerful and 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 very important. Um, and Oh, there was a question. This is an interesting story. There's a question about, you know, why about uh, whether Sir No Sir could be on PBS. It was supposed to be on PBS when it was initially when we initially released it. It was scheduled to be on the PBS series POV, which is a very uh, prestigious series. I don't know if you know this story, Jane, but um, it was vetted. You know, PBS has this uh, policy of uh, uh, no one, no subject of a film can can have uh given money to the to the production of the film uh and jane did not give money to the production of the film she gave money to help the uh the uh distribution of the film uh so when it was programmed on pov that that organization vetted the film and said okay this is fine and then they sent it because of its controversial nature they sent it to pbs national to make sure that they would be okay. And every level of PBS National approved it until it got to the top. I forgot the name of the woman who was in charge at that point. Pat Mitchell, I'm sure. I, I It was either Pat or I know Pat was replaced at one point. I don't remember if it was when she was still there, or if it was the, her, the subject. Which I, it may well have been Pat. Anyway, she nixed it, said nope, because Jane Fonda had had supported the distribution of the film, it was uh, not eligible to be on PBS. And that's the PBS story with uh, with Sir Nostar. Yeah, yeah. Do we want to uh, turn to some of the uh, questions that people have raised uh, on the webinar? Sure, let, let, let me just explain a second about Connie's situation that um, Connie Field was supposed to be talking about 
the whistleblower of me lie. Um, but there was a confusion on scheduling and she was, she tried to get into this even briefly was, and was not able to, and sends her apologies. Um, the, uh, if you look on the bios page, you'll see a link to a program we actually did just about the whistleblower of me lie a couple of years ago for the anniversary of me lie. And so you can get a sense of Connie and also other people who worked on that and, and the, the relevance of it to this program, which not a lot of people knew about is that there was an American helicopter pilot who mm -hmm. observed what was going on and intervened with his helicopter trying to stop some of the shooting and landed it and rescued some people and took them away. And then he suffered grievously afterwards in the way he was treated by the military. Ultimately, in the Obama administration, he received a Medal of Freedom. So there's things <laughs> over time, some justice came. Uh, and there's some very interesting footage of, of his going back to me live. But it's built around an opera that was made about his story. So if you haven't watched it, I think you'll find the the film very moving and watch the panel discussion that we did about it. Um, the, the, the film, I just want to add, I mean, the, the opera is by the Kronos Quartet and it is absolutely gorgeous. And and she did and she absolutely just did a wonderful job of, of, of weaving the opera with with, you know, the documentary footage. And I really I strongly recommend that film it's a very it's a gorgeous film and, and it i don't think it's had nearly the audience that, that it that it should the chronos um played it uh, with in the film um a, a vietnamese woman playing a large vietnamese stringed instrument which is quite fascinating by itself um because it it's a, a rather different form from western music um, and it, it it's perfect for the uh, for the visual part part of it. It's a one person opera, uh, interspersed. Th those of you who haven't seen it, interspersed with um, footage from the actual uh, uh, war in 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 Vietnam, and it, it's it's enormously effective. I have to t tell you one. A minor story about it. We first saw it um, on a trip in Vietnam, uh, in um, Hai An, uh, in the bar of the of the hotel there, where uh, where Connie was able to show it to a group of us who were traveling with John um, Nicole uh, down from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, there was something about the context. It, we were there in order to be able to go to the um, 50th, I don't know, to say celebration. No, hardly. Uh, memorialization um, uh, of the killings at My Lai. Uh, so seeing the film there had an unbelievable impact on, on many of us. Um, we had a couple of, of questions. Um... One was uh, from somebody who is credited in Sir No Sir and wonders, uh, he was honored but was surprised to learn it and wondered, David, what the basis was of crediting people. You're muted Just there. You giving go. us some money. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I think we thanked everyone who had, who had uh, contributed money to the film uh and um i'll look i i i'll um i'll do some research on that and and make sure and 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 see i don't know maybe yeah <laughs> someone mentioned so, earlier i think it was you david but talking about the artists that were involved uh certainly these two films but artists who were involved in uh protesting the war against indochina and I would say those early meetings um, of the 
in Los Angeles, and I remember can't remember what they were called, but a lot of artists were gathering together to try to come up with ways to do anti-war work as artists. Do you remember what that was? Entertainment Industry for Peace and Justice. That's what it was called. And I, yeah, and if we had been able to take more people on FDA, hundreds of those artists would have come with us. I mean, there was so much energy for wanting to do something and yet not really having the the structure or knowing how to use their their talents. And so I would just say to artists who are watching now that these were very big reactions, these two films, as were some of the, the big stars that performed at rallies and demonstrations. But artist contribution doesn't have to be big. It only has to change one person. And I remember doing a little concert somewhere, I think it was in Sacramento. And afterwards a woman came backstage and said that she had, she was in the military, she had a put on dark glasses and a hat and covered up because she had heard it was a lesbian concert, but she wanted to come because that was part of her life. She didn't want to get found out by the military. But she said the part of the concert that really changed her life were the anti-war songs and that she was going to return and file for conscientious objector and remove herself from the military. And a story like that is it's not just one. I mean, Jane has hundreds of them, David has hundreds, we all have hundreds of those stories. And there are those little moments where someone is, it's the drop in the bucket that just takes the, the water over. And artists need to remember, you won't always get to see the consequences of and the effect of the work, but know that it's so essential. It, there's nothing like the music and the theater and the dance and the drama and the painting and the poetry that change people's lives. I wonder, Jane or David, what is happening on the Netflix showings? Do you get any numbers from Netflix about whether people are watching them? They don't. They don't. They don't give numbers. I know that the that Sir No Sir was trending for a few weeks, which I think is an indication of you know. Um, uh, good, you know, good audience, but um, I know that you, 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 you don't get numbers from them. I, 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 since we're talking about films here, uh, I want to interject. There's also a new film by Bar about Barbara Dane uh, called The Nine Lives of Barbara Dane, which is an excellent film. It just premiered at the Mill Valley Film Festival. Um, that's a Speaking of films that reveal a whole lot that you don't know, I mean, I, I certainly was. Uh, there was a her background and her work is uh, is is pretty remarkable um, all the way, you know, for an entire life. She's in her nineties now, so um, uh, nothing. Not that there's anything wrong with being in her nineties, Paul, but but still, you know. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, and the yeah. effect that people like Nina Simone had and uh, Roberta Flack had mm -hmm. and Harry Belafonte had and Odetta had you know these uh these artists that were so central to um keeping these movements uplifted and alive because as we all know it can get very depressing sometimes to to do this tough work and then along comes a song and uh Barbara was just out there singing Barbara Day in the film you mentioned just singing 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 Somebody wants to know what did Rita Martinson do after the FTA show? I just, I got a very beautiful email from her the other day, um, but I, I don't know what she's done. Do you, Holly? No. She sure made Mart a difference. Oh. Rita Martinson was in several films by, um, wait, I'm going to look it up. I know who you mean. <laughs> and what was Haskell Wexler's involvement in FTA? None. No, who was the filmmaker then? Other other than um, Maxine, were were there other people of note that worked on? I don't remember. Sorry. One of our organizers was Elaine Ellison. Remember Elaine? Yeah. Somebody asked the the name of of Connie's film that it, it's uh, and the of the opera itself about hugh thompson it, it's the whistleblower of me lie the whistleblower of me lie and it it, it is available 
So here's an interesting question from Doug Bradley. Is it primarily because of the all volunteer army that there doesn't seem to be a GI movement in today's military? It's a good question. I, I, th I think that the all volunteer army would make a big difference. Don't you, Dave? Mm -hmm. Yes, but there are other factors. And, and one thing that's always, that I always emphasize is that some of the, some of the, the, the most intense anti-war activism in the in, during the Vietnam War came from enlistees. It did not come from draftees. And, and the reason was because people, enlistees were the ones who were betrayed. They were the ones who went in thinking they were, you know, like Don Duncan, Don Duncan talks about, you know, they thought what they were going to do was going to be good. Yeah. Uh, draftees, a lot of times it was, you know, I'm just going to keep my head down and get the hell out of here, you know, which is understandable. But but draftees were a huge part of the of the, the movement. But one, even though the military denies that there was an anti-war, a, a GI movement, they learned a lot from it. And there were there are many things that the, the military did in this ensuing decades. Um, for example, there's no such thing as KP anymore. KP was, you know, GIs having to do all the, the, the cleanup and everything. No, nope, nope. Now they have servants doing all of that. Um, the food. Uh, I, I, the, I, I was told this amazing thing by a, a vet from uh, the Iraq war uh, who talked about the, the during the Iraq war, the, the green zone you know, was like, you know, uh, Disneyland. Um, this is where the, the the troops were when they were not out in the field. Um, they had every fast food restaurant imaginable. Um, he, he said actually that one of the biggest problems the military faced in Iraq was obesity. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the little things that played a big role in, 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 you know, in, in kind of, uh, fueling the anti-war movement among the GIs have all been kind of cleaned up. Another thing, though, that I thought was interesting, the same guy talked about, you know, I, uh, um, there was a, a, a movement and was most, you know, of Iraq vets against uh, that war. Um, but what a lot of folks said is that one of the things that that was true in Iraq that wasn't true in Vietnam was that your chances of survival as an American GI were much higher. Um, and so again, there was kind of this sense of, you know, keep my head down, come back alive. Um, you know, so uh, there were a number of, you know, things. And the, frankly, the fact that the anti-war movement in uh, uh, the civilian anti-war movement during the Iraq war uh, uh, disintegrated once the war started. There was no, there wasn't the kind of civilian support and and civilian support was was crucial for the GI movement. And I want to give a shout out here to Paul, our, our moderator who worked with the United States Servicemen's Fund that raised money to keep the coffee houses open. And I can tell you there were many months when the way we kept the coffee houses open was we we had Wonder Bread for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, it, it, you know, it, it was a real struggle all the time to keep these places running to fund the movement and and the United States Servicemen Fund was a a very strong organization that raised money for you know for that and and you know th there's you can't have one without the other there has to be an interplay yes. there has to be a civilian movement along with you know uh along with the GI movement and that had a that had a big impact you know i mean the the that's what that's the civilian movement did inspire the, the GI movement in a big way, you know, certainly as things went, as time went on. And vice versa. Well, th th thanks. Thanks, David. That that's very kind of you. The the um, let, let me make a, a one little shout out for for one of these hidden people. Uh, and that's Bob Zevin, Robert Zevin. Bob was um, he's he's still alive and uh, and kicking, but he he was the person who um designed the uh, financial basis for an earlier organization, Resist, that came out in 1967 uh, out of the call to resist illegitimate authority. Um, Robert designed a monthly pledge system. And I remember my son, who was then um, maybe eight or 10, um, sending $5 a month uh, for the um, uh, for for resist, it was Robert who worked 
with Howard Levy uh, and with Freddie Gardner, um, among others, uh, to start the U.S. Servicemen's Fund that David uh, re referred to. And, you know, the, the work of a person like like uh, like Bob Zevin gets hidden under the, the rocks of history. And uh, I, I wanted to um, bring him to, to the surface as one of those people who enabled um, a lot of the work that many of us did um, by the way in which he put things together. He was quite, he was quite wonderful. He was also- I just wanted to point out that the, um, apparently I was up in Canada and they said that one of the largest groups of uh, resistors who came across and moved to Canada were not in fact men escaping the draft, but women with young sons. <laughs> decided to take their children That's and go fascinating. to Canada prior to them becoming of age to be drafted. And that that was, I've never found out what that statistic was, but they said there was lots, wow. of, it was a, probably more than actually the, the men who were resisting the draft. And also that there have been anti-war, there have been soldiers resisting war in other countries. There have been soldiers resisting war in the Ireland, England, con there's soldiers in Israel resisting war. There's been soldiers in mm -hmm. many wars around who just say, I, I can't do what I'm being asked to do. And I, I think it's a, important to, to know that it's, it's a, a global phenomenon that a human being who is being asked to, to, to kill and pillage and rape or commit genocide has a moment where they put it down and they say, I can't do this. Put me in jail, do whatever you need to do, but I'm not I'm not carrying out your policy anymore. I think we should all know that Henry Kissinger has died. Since we're talking about Vietnam, it seems Oh my like goodness. Just today? Just, just right now. It this came moment. Up. He who said uh <laughs> I mean, those of us who learned about Vietnam, about the country and its people. We couldn't help but not like Henry Kissinger, who felt that they could be bought off, that everybody has a price tag, he said. And we knew that that wasn't going to be the case, that, that Vietnam had fought for thousands of years and usually won. And eventually we were not going to prevail there and um, they can't be bought off. So rest what a perpetuator of just terrible policy again and again. He kept showing up in Chile. And you know, this was not a, a nice man who did not did not well, help the world. Watch Fog of War right next to the Henry Kissinger interviews about Vietnam. One was McNamara and one was Kissinger. McNamara admitted that he'd made a terrible mistake, that we really did not understand the Vietnamese. He thought they were all Catholic and he didn't get it. Whereas Kissinger was to the end totally unapologetic. I think we've run out of time, John. We have. Yes, we have. Yeah, and, can, I, can I just say John one was suggesting thing. maybe Holly wants to uh, end with a little song. Oh, I don't know. Um, what were you going to say, David? And then we'll... I do want to respond. We've had one, one uh, attendee, you know, uh, mentioning Palestine and, and asking if anything can be said about it. And I do want to say that that this is, yes, a... a a genocide that's being carried out by Israel with bombs provided by the United States. There was a New York Times article that talked about just every bomb that's been dropped on the the the, the children of, of Gaza came from the United States and it's being very, very much sanctioned by by uh, um, Biden. Uh, and this is something that there needs to be much more uh outrage about one of the best things that's been happening is that several low level uh people in the state department have been resigning and very publicly condemning what the united states is doing by supporting this 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 genocide that's happening um and i you know there I'll, I'll there's my i mean there's lots of there. lots of argument about the use of the term genocide and and the problem of this history is that people in Israel feel that they are the targets of genocide. This, this, um, excuse me, John. Yeah. This program is about the war in Vietnam and the GI. Right. 
I do not think we should divert into an entirely different situation, much as we all have a lot to say about it. This is I, not I agree. So, Any uh, rate, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane, in particular, for having inspired us so much in the Indochina peace campaign and in all of the work that you've continued to do for a reasonable environmental <laughs> policy. But I am open and I am willing for to be hopeless would seem so strange. It dishonors those who go before us. So lift me up to the light of change. And then there's a lot of verses, but we'll end it there. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank you, Paul, for moderating. <laughs> So, say thank again, you, Holly Dave. and Jane and David, and thank you, John, for supporting this work again and again. We could not do it without you. And thank have you. fun in Cuba. All right, housekeeping. Um, hopefully, I will be able to get this all done and put out on YouTube, and we'll send a note to everybody who registered. Um, and It'll take a little longer, but all of the chat will also be posted. If you go, I won't be back until the 13th, but if after the 13th, if you go to the uh, blog page, the bios page, you'll be able to find the link to the chat. So don't worry about trying to keep notes on what was in the chat. Um, and uh, once you get the get the video please share it with friends colleagues family um i mean i think we did what we wanted to which is to create another piece of history so thank you again one one person had uh, and made a good suggestion that that you post the titles of the films that um and they're all on that play page the bios page has right. the films right. and the links for people that people can watch them um so go uh, go to that bio I, when i send out the note through zoom with the link for the the uh, video on youtube i'll remind people of that page and and that's where you can find the links for all three of the films so thank you again thanks